So you're telling me there's four kinds of core values? We'd better get into that now on the Church Revitalization Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfers Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and AJ Matthew. Welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast. My name is Scott Ball. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, AJ Matthew. All right, AJ. Today we're talking about core values. This is um, maybe a topic that I don't know that's going to be like burning up the charts. If I'm just being totally honest. Um, like I don't know that anyone's waking up in the middle of the night and going, hey, my core values. I, I don't know that anybody is writing best-selling books on core values. Like, a, you know, vision's a fun topic and strategy's yeah. a fun topic. Core values feels like, okay. And yet, I want to make the case at the beginning of this episode that core values are way more important than people give it credit for. And so if you are listening in the opening seconds of this podcast... You do not want to turn this off because I want you to understand and see over the course of this episode, I kind of want to convince you that you need to be thinking about core values through the lens of these four types of core values. Uh And they have a massive impact on what's happening in your church, good and bad. Yeah, I totally agree. Everybody thinks that it's like they're, it's obligatory. We just... We know we have to have a list of core values, so we'll do that. It's just yeah. It even gets listed exercise. when people when people talk about, oh yeah, we want to work on our mission, vision, values. Like it's throwaway at the end of that when people say that. Um, and uh, so let me maybe I'll start by giving a definition, a working definition of values. I'm not saying this is the definitive definition, um, the end all be all definition, but this is the one that um, we use, and it's one we're going to use today. We would say that your core values are the constant and passionate core motivations that empower and guide action in your ministry, or put in in a really short way, values animate action in your ministry. They yeah. um, think of think of your your church or your ministry like a puppet, you know, and it's just kind of lifeless. Uh, but when you've got to put a hand in there to to make it move and talk, and your values are like that, they're the they're the hand inside the puppet that animate action yeah. in in your church. They're the reason why you do the things you do. And again, both good and bad. So if you see, man, we keep making these same mistakes. We we constantly fall into the same trap. Odds are there's a value at the heart of that that is guiding and motivating that action. Or if you look at positive things in your church and go, hey, we're really good at this. We see a lot of fruit from this. Yeah. Odds are it's not the clarity of your vision or the um, expertness of your strategy. At the heart of that is likely a value that's motivating mm-hmm. that behavior. So, Values is the Holy Spirit of the... <laughs> Strategic planning, healthy church, Trinity, a lot more going on there, not ever sure. getting the credit, you know, every good yeah, thing is out. Right, oh, right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you God for that. And the Holy Spirit is like, excuse me, do you realize what I'm over here doing? Uh, uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it, it definitely That's the values. Yeah. It's the, the values animate. The, it animates the church. And so um, if that's true and, I, and I'm, I'm asking you to believe me when I say your values determine kind of your fruitfulness and faithfulness. Uh, If that's true, then you got to get your values right. And so there are four kinds of core values, and we're going to, we're going to kind of walk through each of these four types. And and as we're doing this, you can maybe do some self-reflection. Like last week we talked about, do some self-scouting, figure out where do I maybe need to do some extra work. Um, because even though these things animate your church and guide behavior in your church, they are not static. They they adapt and they move and they change, and and you can control that to some degree. Um, it's a little bit like habits. Like 
your habits impact mm -hmm. your life. Your yeah. habits left on their own are relatively static, but they, they don't have to be that way. You can work on your habits and they can change the outcome of your life. Same kind of deal. So yeah, um, that, that actually even gets into Aubrey, you know, when he, when Aubrey wrote about core values, he included more kind of some different categories, but even as you relate them to habits, he, Aubrey would also talk about, it's not included today, but Aubrey would talk about conscious versus unconscious values. Um, and a lot of that is sort of habits that we do things that are happening by rote, um, below the level of consciousness that we're not really processing intentionally thinking about, um, so, you know, that's, we're not going to get into conscious versus unconscious values. It's not terribly hard to understand that, but, um, but raising things to the level of consciousness so that we act on them, we're intentional about what they are and then act on them. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll definitely cover in these first couple of, uh, of categories. Yep. All right. So let's, uh, let's dive in then. Man. Number one is the big one, actual discipleship values. Um, and you're going to hear us referring, we're going to, we're going to use the term healthy churches a lot on this episode. Uh, the term discipleship will come up, um, because that is what the church, that's what the church is all about is, is discipling people, um, increasing in maturity, becoming more Christ-like, um, and healthy values in a healthy church drive those kinds of actions. So the actual values that we, um, presently live out in our church um, they could be healthy or unhealthy. They could be conscious or unconscious, but it's what's actually happening. Um, when we work with churches, we actually do a core values audit to try to determine like, what is really our primary drivers right now? And, uh, and that's a great exercise. Um, and this is another one of those things kind of, as we are saying at the beginning, Scott, where people just kind of brush off core values, maybe don't really know what, what really is the point. Um, yeah. And then whenever you take the time to do that, to raise them to the conscious level to determine what your actual values are, it's frequently eye-opening for churches, um, sure. whether they are maybe uh, more on the unhealthy side or even trending more towards the health side of their ministry, determining their actual values is sometimes eye-opening. So uh, yeah, the, the actual values that your church, you have to determine this before you know whether you're in a healthy position or not, um, or yeah, what so, actions you might need to take for change. Right. So when we talk about actual healthy sort of discipleship values, you need some standard by which to judge, and which is kind of yeah. what you're getting at. And so it, at the Malfurst Group, we use Acts 2 as a framework for understanding what does a healthy church look like in its sort of most, in its healthiest form, and we do understand that Acts 2 is is descriptive more than it is prescriptive, but it is describing a thing that is healthy. And so yeah. um, we can use that then to, to look at ourselves and go, oh, do we see these same sorts of values and behaviors in our own church? Things like worship and things like fellowship and things like biblical instruction and things like prayer. Do we see these same sort of values and actions and behaviors in our own church? Um, and I th one of the pushbacks that we sometimes get when we apply this framework is churches will say, well, we don't need to really talk about those things because we're a church. So of course we value those things. Mm -hmm. mm. No, <laughs> uh, I think you're going to uh, say you value them. Yeah, yeah that's a right, given. Yeah. <laughs> right. But if we, but do I see that you value them? Because yeah. if it's a value... I'm, I should be able to witness it. I should be able to see it. It should be so manifest um, that it's obvious. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I like to say you cannot assume it. You need to articulate it. Um, another pushback on this is that people go, well, that's just gen it's generic. You know, and go, all right. And we're going to talk about things that are not generic here in just a second. But um I, I hear that criticism. I understand it. Um, but here's my pushback. If that's your feeling on it, it's a very American perspective in this mm -hmm. sort of like feeling that I need to be a special snowflake in order to to be important or for it to be meaningful. And the reality is that 
it's not your church, little C church that matters. It's the big C church that matters. And we we share a DNA, or we ought to, at the universal level of the church, because there's one Lord, one spirit, one head of the church. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we're one family. We should have shared family values. And these these discipleship values should be shared family values across all of us. And yet, not all of our individual expressions of the of the Big C Church are expressing these shared family values the way that we ought to. That's why we need to articulate them and hone in on them. Um, so I, I guess I just want to push back against anybody who would say we shouldn't focus on those sort of generic church values or discipleship values. They're the fundamentals of what it means to be a healthy church. Yeah. Of course we have to focus on them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would, yeah, that would be like, I'm not a sports guy, Scott, but I'm maybe going in for kind of a sports analogy, but fundamentals, you know, are core to most sports. Um, like, oh, we don't need to talk so, about tackling. We don't need to be talking about running exactly, the ball. Yeah, we right. can just assume like, we're a football team. So of course it's well, like, it's, hmm. we got a whole book of trick plays. We're going to work on all these trick plays that are going to, you know, bend the minds of the opponent um but yeah we can't actually catch a ball we can't tackle we can't run um that's i think a lot of churches do that they they yeah, I, I saw they, a couple of uh, playoff games this weekend that were lost with that kind of thinking <laughs> oh, yeah, mercy I, I, it was dangerous for me to maybe even dip my toe into that realm oh, my goodness. let's all pour one out for the dallas cowboys huh I, I, another I season how sad you would be <laughs> <laughs> i can't even think about it I'm, it makes but me you know I mean, even i mean Guys, let's get down to the root of these words. We're using the word actual discipleship values, actual. And we're talking about action. Um, and we're talking about the book of Acts, <laughs> Acts of the Apostles, <laughs> Acts of the Holy Spirit, Acts of the Church. Um, this is all coming from the same place. You know, I mean, this is these are not just ethereal things. These are not just nice ideas. Um, and they do not just come naturally to everybody um, especially to newer newer believers. I mean, these things have to be um, have to be taught, um, and they have to be caught by uh, you know watching what mature believers do. Um, and so that's what we drive towards. Um, now, these things, I'd like these, to push they, back on that just a bit. What part? I actually think that there's something counterintuitive here. That I think that a brand new believer does some of these behaviors instinctually. I was actually sort of going there. Yeah, I agree. Oh, okay, I was going to say, yeah, I think yeah. that w what's interesting is that our churches don't reinforce these things, so we stop doing them. Yeah. But I think, you know, a brand new believer, you don't have to tell them, read your Bible. Yeah. They're, they, like, can't read it enough. They're, they're, they're like, just absorbing it. Exactly. Now, they're yep. getting things wrong. They're misunderstanding things. Like, they need... They need direction, you yeah. Know, but sharing your faith, they're like, they're the most excited about sharing their faith. Yep. You know, and we depro because we have such ineffective values in our churches. We deprogram, yeah, that's people right. away from what comes naturally to them when they first like it comes from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so maybe they, instead of saying these things are better taught, they're better reinforced. Um, the church should reinforce these things because I mean, look at the book of Acts anyway. Or cultivated I mean, or developed. Yeah. Maybe it would be the birth of the church at Pentecost, 5,000 were added to their number that day in verse 41, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. They, the Holy Spirit was the driving force, but, you know, he imparted these things into them. And, and it was a natural expression of the church at the birth of the church. Um, you know, the, the apostles didn't. Then it wasn't like five thousand out of the number that day, and the apostles gathered together for six months to 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 determine what should we do as a church. You know, yeah, um, there was a six month marketing campaign trying to get them to join community <laughs> groups. Like, no, they, they searched the scriptures and determined that the church should devote itself to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. No, they didn't need to do any of that. It it came instinctually. Yes, and and what we have to come face to face with, I think, is that so many of our churches have. We have literally deprogrammed these things out of like we've we have beaten the life out of our people. Yeah. And our churches don't reflect what what ought to come naturally to the believer anymore. Um, and that's the work of the enemy. That's the work of our flesh kind of 
fighting against the work of the spirit in us. But um, that doesn't all the more reason that we need to highlight these values and go, this is what the life of a believer looks like. Yeah. A life of the life of a believer values these things Mm -hmm. and cultivates them. Yeah. And I think if you put that, if you brought these more to the forefront, it would feel natural for people because I think this is part of God's natural order, um, especially with his, his adopted sons and daughters. Um, It would probably begin to feel like this, this is good. The, a you breath know. of fresh air, <laughs> yeah. like oh, this is what this is what this is supposed to be like. Yeah. yeah totally. All right, we've spent m- more time here than we need to. Let's move on. All right, the next one we're talking about is aspirational values, and so these are again, these are these are not at the conscious level unless you spend the time searching for them. Um, and so there there are things then at our definition of aspirational values. These would be the things that you know you should be valuing, but you presently are not. Uh, But that happens generally through an exercise um, of determining what are our present actual values. Um, And then again, we can look in Acts chapter two, we can, we can then put our, put our, our present values, our actual values up against those that we see in the first century church and, um, and find where our gaps are. Um, And there's usually one or more. Um, It's, it's rare that churches are really uh, nailing a lot of those, um, you know, in with great efficiency and effectiveness. Um, but determining then that we we are, have fallen short somewhere is hugely important, obviously. I mean, if we're not active in living out one or more of these values, then um, where does that leave us if we don't make the decision then to name it and begin working towards it to improve it? Um, that's that would be a huge, a huge failure. Uh, to know that we're sh- coming up short somewhere and not work towards improving it. Um, and that's the purpose of aspirational values. It's a mm-hmm. motivator. It's a, uh, it's a waypoint. It's um, it's a marker that uh, we can work towards strategize around and, um, and make changes so that we can hit it. Yeah. I think you've said everything that really that needs to be said are, um, you know, if you heard us talking about these actual values and you, and something sparked inside of you and you go, oh, I want that in my church, that gap you feel between mm-hmm. what you experience in your church right now and sort of an ax to vibrancy, that, that gap, that's where your aspirational values live. And you need to be able to name those things specifically and go, what is that gap? Cause there, my guess is there are parts of an ax to lifestyle or an ax to church that you go, we do this. But wherever you feel that that disconnect and go, oh, that doesn't describe us at all. That that's how you would articulate what those aspirational values are, and they they exist. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but they exist because you probably have some unhealthy thing that's competing with it. Um, it's like a cancer, and so it's eating up your church, and so you now have spiritual malnutrition, which is which is causing this gap. Um, in your discipleship values. And so mm-hmm. um, you want to be able to articulate that and in any sort of resonance where you f- feel in your heart, man, my church isn't everything. If I, when I read Acts 2 and I look at my church and I don't, I don't see the culture being the same. I'm not talking about the strategy. I'm not talking about all the, I'm talking about this, the culture of that church. And then you look at the culture of your church, wherever there's a gap, that those are where your aspirational values live. Yeah. Yep. Um, the next category that we're going to talk about is unique values. Um, and this is, I don't know, unique values can be dangerous uh, because if you if you determine, oh, ever we should be unique, then you'll be digging and searching for something to say that this is our unique value. You don't have to have anything unique um, unless it is something that really is positively helpful um, in in you know driving your church forward in these other you know healthy actual values um, that would make a positive impact or help define the culture. They're usually culture related, Scott. Don't you find um, unique values? Uh, trying to think of some examples now. You know something that's um, I can think of. I can think of several. I worked with a church that um, had a huge adoption culture to it. 
um, just lots of people had adopted kids and that was, a, and the church had ministries focused that way. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, that was, that turned out to be one of their, one of their unique values, um, was that, that they had, they valued adoption and, um, you know, the, this value within families, of uh, providing that, that kind of love and care. Um, I think a really easy example of this is our friends in the international church. Yes. Uh, as we talked about on the podcast in the past, but for those who don't know, when we said, when we're talking about international churches, I'm not talking about churches that are outside of the U.S. I'm, I'm talking about a specific kind of church, which is an English-speaking, usually mm -hmm. English-speaking congregation in a global context, yeah. where the people who are attending this church um, are generally expats from all around the world, but they come together in this uh, English speaking congregation and they build community there. So um, that would be a really good example of where a unique value in the international church is the fact that they are generally expats, mm -hmm. you know, however you might describe that, that we are, we are building community in a foreign country. Like that's, that's the thing yeah. that unites. Them. That is a really um, good example. Yeah. That's not going to be true of now. Every church might have some people from some other country, but it's unique that virtually every person who attends that church is from mostly not from the country where it is. Like, like so if the church right. is in Germany, 90% of the people are not from Germany. There might be some Germans, but they're going to mostly not be German. Yeah. Um, it could be something else. So yep. that would be unique. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great example of a unique value. Um, you know, I like the like multi-ethnic community. Like that would be, um, that's not true for every church. If you, if you live in East Tennessee where I live, you could try, but it would be hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think, you know, this, uh, just, there are unique situations. Culture. Yeah. I mean, there's churches that are in, um, college towns, you know, and maybe right, right next yep. to, to, uh, college campuses or military installations. Um, these are, these are things that are unique. You know, your, your geography might have something. So, I mean, we said earlier, this is a lot of these we, are culture oriented, but it could be geography. We worked with a church. You and I both worked with the church, uh, where, uh, it was a retirement community. Like, yeah, you, legally you had to be 60 plus to live there. Yeah. That impacts the, the culture of the church. Yeah. And the right. values of the church. Because there, there, there's no children's ministry, not because <laughs> yeah. they hate kids, but you're not you're not allowed to live there unless you're 60. So I mean, maybe grandkids, but right, yeah, but probably <laughs> not coming to church there every Sunday. So yeah, I mean, it was unique to them to have to minister to retired people, exclusively um, retired, retired, yeah. retired age. I, they weren't all retired, but retiree True, sort yeah. of age. Yeah, yeah. There you go. All right, so uh, we've talked actual values. We've talked aspirational Maybe values. just watching the podcast just now. I totally just spilled. You're doing a spit take? Was that funny? Yeah. <laughs> You're just choking? <laughs> choking yeah. on every word? That's a, that's a special view for those of you watching on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked actual values, aspirational values, unique values. And our fourth one today is anti-values. They go against things that we're doing that are... In some, in many ways, actively working against the health of our church, and and as I said at the top, the values can be conscious or or unconscious or subconscious. Um, anti values uh, frequently are not conscious. We're not. Nobody is getting up every day and like, let's go do some. What are stuff my anti values? Really <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, exercising through this and having a discovery process, which doesn't need mm -hmm. to be lengthy, but. Um, can unveil uh, some things that um, that are not healthy going on in the church. Um, these could be, uh, you know, a common one that comes up is just holding on to traditions or methodologies or even objects of the past um, that that just they're not culturally relevant anymore. They're not helping um, helping to educate people in the scriptures to a greater degree. They're not helping people to um, view God um, 
in, rightly to a greater degree. They're not helping them to worship better. Um, there's a lot of things out there like that, that churches just hold on to. And it's like, this is a hill we're willing to die on. Um, and at some point those then, they 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 actively work against the church, not necessarily because there's something active about it, but it because it becomes a barrier to maybe the next generation or to just the people that are, are closer to live closer to the church now. Um, just over time, this thing or or many things is just not allowing them to relate well to people, to express who God is, and to help people mature in the faith. Um, and those need to be surfaced and changed um, because there there is no value in something that actively works against the church. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one area where I have personally maybe changed a little bit or evolved a little bit. You know, I'm I'm more apt to defend the existence of a tradition now more than I was ten years ago. Say, but. The, the question isn't the tradition. The question is, it's about, it's a question of motivations. Why am I defending this thing? Why am I promoting this thing? Why am I so fixated on this thing? Is it for the sake of the tradition itself? Is it, um, or is there some value of this tradition that is really important that we need, that needs preservation um, yeah. and needs instruction? And And when we think about scripture, for example, um, Paul talks about the importance of passing on sound doctrine, like passing on sound teaching. So sometimes I think people will go, mm, we just want to get rid of this tradition. Um, but the line between tradition and sound doctrine, it, it can sometimes be really thin. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we can get it wrong one way or the other. So we can be abandoning something that is sound doctrine just because we said, well, that's just a tradition. And sometimes we can be calling something sound doctrine when it's merely a human tradition. And this is what Jesus is doing constantly, is it not? In the Sermon on the Mount, he's kind of blasting mm -hmm. that which has been assigned to sound doctrine, but is actually simply human tradition. And he's trying to reestablish, no, this is this is sound doctrine. This is, this is the heart of the teaching. And so I, I think that it requires a little bit of soul work and thinking to go, what are we preserving? Is this sound doctrine or is this just human tradition? And if it is a human tradition, is it one worth preserving or is it an impediment to something that's more healthy? Mm -hmm. So I think another example of this that's common would be churches that are cheap or, you know, uh, you know, they're not willing to invest money in anything and it, they behave as if they're saving up for their retirement, which the church is not retiring. Um, and so uh, they... They don't, they don't invest in the next generation. They don't invest in ministries. The they they maybe don't even invest in their facility. They kind of duct tape problems rather than actually fix them. They don't invest in resources to um, be better at communicating with the, their community. They don't, and so they fall further and further and further behind. And so then the amount of money it would take to actually turn things around increases year after year after year, which makes them more protective of their money. And it's this downward protectionist spiral um, and that uh, prevents them from being evangelistic, that prevents them from being effective in teaching scripture, which prevents them from doing all sorts of things. And so um, going back to up to the top of our values, our list of four types, AJ, the top we had actionable, healthy discipleship values. And then we built beneath that. We had um, aspirational Aspiration. values. And I mentioned, Hey, wherever there's that gap between when you look at acts two and you go, Oh, we're not there. The reason for that gap is going to be this fourth. There's going to be some unhealthy value that has mm -hmm. metastasized and prevented you from living out to, from being a fully healthy Acts 2 church. Yeah. Um, I would even point to, it's not just small churches and declining churches, AJ. You see this, if you walk into a large mega church situation, I'm not talking about walking in on Sunday morning. I'm talking about walking to a staff meeting. 
and take and and take a pulse on the culture in there sometimes it's really toxic yeah so it looks good on the outside but you go you go an inch deep and you find all sorts of problems um there are there are anti-values there as well that are metastasizing in the form of you know maybe consumerism maybe um um greed maybe all, all sorts of things so um we all have heart work to do all of us on an individual level and on a corporate level but i would i always encourage churches when when you and i are working with them aj to don't don't blow past this yeah. because if your church isn't fully healthy then there is an anti value that's holding you back and you're not you aren't serving anyone if you aren't willing or able to name that thing yeah yeah, for sure. Uh, go back and read Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47, and try this out. See which one of those actions you could take out and the church be fine. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I dare you. <laughs> oh, I know I which think, one everyone uh, would pick. You know which one everybody if, the, what they would take out? Yeah, it's the one that everyone already takes out. <laughs> It's the um, signs and wonders. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't need signs and wonders. Yeah. Cessationism. Most often. Most that was, often. That was me. That was me just yeah. throwing a grenade. Sorry. Most <laughs> often, uh, yeah, evangelism gets gets lost in the mix somewhere. I know. I was just, and, I was uh, just being just being silly. But yeah. We don't want to take any of those out. Should we jettison uh, fellowship? Should we jettison prayer? Should we jettison worship? Should we jettison generosity? I don't think so. Oh, um, I think, I, you, when you reread I it, think we're you jettisoning, wanna... jettisoning biblical instruction these days. Feels like. Yeah. Not me. Not me and you. The culture. I'm like, yeah. that Bible? Outdated. Yeah. Ir irrelevant. Yeah, for sure. How's And how's that working out? Yeah, exactly. All right, well, there you go. Uh, a look at values, four different kinds of values that if you hadn't really considered, I think uh, it would be well worth your time to do that. Grab your team together, your ministry leaders, and um, have a look at that. We've got a we got a tool that we'd be glad to to uh, walk you through also, um, Church Core Values Audit. If you wanted uh, some help doing that, you can reach out to us um, through any of the platforms that you're listening or watching this on or email us at leadership at malfordsgroup.com. Uh, we'd love to open up a conversation with you about that. Uh, if you're outside the U.S., um, you can go to healthychurchesglobal.com um, and receive some training um, on uh, on values in there as a part of what we have out there for, uh, for churches outside of North America. Um, speaking of that, Scott, um, we also need your support to be able to maintain a website like that, uh, create that kind of content, um, and uh, make these trips to various parts of the world that that um, we have done in increasing numbers to help build up the church worldwide. So reach out to us also about your church here in North America, partnering with us um, anywhere around the world. We, if you if you have been blessed with resources outside of North America and would like to partner with us to make uh, that uh, possible, we would love to have that conversation with you. This is been of, episode. Yes. Hey, before we wrap up. Yeah. This time next week. Mm -hmm. When are so this this episode that you're listening to drops on Wednesday, January 17th. Next week's episode that will drop on Wednesday, January was it 24th? Um AJ will be in I I don't want to say where you're gonna be, but you're gonna be I think it's probably good not to, to broadcast where you are. But you're not going to be in this country. Right. So prayers for safe travel. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm not going to say it's like the most dangerous place in the world, but it's a it's developing not, nation. It's, though. it's a developing nation. It's a developing nation. And so <laughs> yeah. it's not, it's not going to the UK. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So just prayers for safe travel. It's a lot of travel. It's long travel. Yeah. It's exhausting. 
but amazing work you're going to get to do. And I can't wait to share more about that when you get. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Be praying for those folks. Uh, and our, our attendance is continuing to increase. So, um, it seems like a fairly large, uh, audience. Um, and so we're, we're, we're really thankful for that, uh, that we can help train up, uh, pastors and church planters there. So there you go. This has been episode 224 of the Church Revitalization Podcast. So you can go to malfersgroup.com slash 224 and read today's article um, and have links over there to YouTube and uh, and other things. We would love to hear from you again. Last week we talked mission, got some feedback on mission. Thanks for doing that. We love hearing that. So uh, if you want to talk values, drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. <music>